Okay, good morning and uh, welcome everyone. Let's pray and we will continue with our study of the book of Acts. Thus far we have reached Acts chapter 7 and today we will go through with Acts chapter 8 and the following, um, you know, the incidents that took place in the early church. So let's pray. Abba Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. Lord, we thank you that uh, you're carrying us forward, Lord. And Lord, we thank you especially, Lord, for this opportunity to learn your word. Your word is the foundation of our lives. And Lord, as we build our lives on the word, the rock, God, we know that no matter what, comes our way, Lord, we will stand strong. Even today we pray, Lord, let the word be our anchor. For each of us, let your word be our anchor. We worship you, we honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Acts chapter 8 is uh, where we see a season of persecution. In Acts chapter 7, what happened? Stephen's martyrdom, we spoke about that. And we saw how people got together against this believer. So what is the trend which we are observing? Earlier, Peter and John were put in prison. And then we read that the apostles were put in the prison. So the leaders were being targeted. But at this point, there is a believer of the church who is being persecuted. So persecution is spreading far and wide. And it's affecting all believers in the church. So that's where we are at. We are at a season of great persecution. This is a few years after... The baptism in the Holy Spirit, the church ha has become a, uh, you know, a powerful spiritual entity. We saw that uh, it has grown up to, let's say, around 12,000 people. By now, the church of Jerusalem, there are uh, amazing leaders. There are amazing men and women of God growing uh, strong in God's word. They are rooted in the word. We saw how a believer, an ordinary believer of the church, a volunteer, he preaches from scriptures. He's talking about Moses and the patriarchs and so many different things. So they are strong in the word. They are strong in the work of the spirit. Uh, Stephen, he was known for signs and wonders. So that's the way the church has grown. The first eight years, remember when we started the study of the book of Acts, we said the first eight years is when we will see the church thriving in the city of Jerusalem. And from there, the missionary work will start off. The missionary work at that point was already going on in the city. Peter preached his first sermon. 3,000 people were brought to the kingdom at that point. And then up to eight years, church is thriving and thriving within the city. But in a season of persecution, what is it that is happening here in the church? That's what we will look at. So Acts chapter 8, verse 1. It says, now Saul was consenting to his death. Whose death? Stephen's death. Saul is involved. He is one of those persecutors. We know later, in the very next chapter, Acts chapter 9, he will encounter Jesus and he will become, uh, he will start his journey as one of the uh, prominent leaders of the early church. But his identity in Acts chapter 8 is persecutor. He was consenting to the death of Stephen. So he was probably leading this martyr, martyrdom. Okay. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So something has happened right now. Persecution. And because of persecution, what is happening to the people? Scattered. So think about this. You know, uh, there is 
the church that you know, maybe right now we are all part of certain churches and if there is persecution in the city and everyone goes to different different parts of the city or different parts of the country other places they leave the city and go what do we expect what do we expect the church was growing big church was thriving people were strong in the word strong in the spirit it was wonderful now there is persecution people are leaving people are leaving the city people are going what 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 shall we expect church will spread is is that going to be a powerful thing or is it going to be a sad thing because our church in jerusalem was mighty but now where people are leaving aha uh -huh. it can thrive okay so yeah that's that's a good way of looking at it and that's exactly what it what happened so when we disciple the people uh, and the work of the spirit is powerful god's work cannot be stopped you remember gamaliel's statement we saw gamaliel said that if it is god nobody can stop it and they're trying to stop it peter and john don't preach in the name of jesus not able to stop church is growing again apostles put them in the jail supernaturally they come out gamaliel says you can if it is god's work it's not going to stop great persecution comes stephen is martyred great persecution in the city of jerusalem acts chapter 8 people are spreading all over the place but the work of god is continuing so even this it's it's not it's it's not a um, if if you can put it this way that it's not this agenda will not stop the work of the church the church is only going to spread far and wide and god's work will continue in different places it's like that it's if you take fire and to control the fire we kind of split the the sparks we say no fire you can't be here sparks you go to different parts what will happen wherever you throw the spark there'll be a new fire there'll be a forest fire that's more dangerous but that's very similar to how the church started spreading to new regions for those of us who are connected online you can see the map i have uh, put out a map there where you can see the regions surrounding you know jerusalem you can see the judea part and you have different cities uh, within judea jerusalem uh, you know bethlehem bethany hebron jericho so many places within judea and then there's a close by region samaria so you can see the blue portion samaria further up as you go the galilee region further up north uh, to the north east you have a uh, decapolis uh, peria so there are different regions at this point people could not limit themselves to jerusalem there is persecution they may have been worried for their lives for their families so they move to other parts of the region but the work of god no matter where they went they could have gone to some place here or further from here god's work continued and that's the beauty of uh, the kingdom of god that nothing stopped them so verse 2 so in the first verse we saw there was great persecution people spread into the region of judea samaria uh, primarily you know uh, they they went there the apostles where were the apostles jerusalem apostles stayed back but the people left okay and there were devout men who carried stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him so the the grief and the pain of the church is very real a uh, believer has died in this persecution so uh, it's a tough thing uh, what's going on right now 
and the persecution scene is so tight in verse 3 it says Saul he made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging off men and women committing them to prison so now those who are believing are being put into prisons and it's quite severe from what we notice here it's directed towards the church there's it's it's not like uh, there is some issue in the city and because of that the church is being affected this is targeted to the church oh you're believing in this jesus we don't like it stop preaching in the name of jesus if you don't we'll put you in the prison every house it says saul was so passionate as a persecutor they went house to house dragging people out and in fact historically we wouldn't see women being dragged out uh, commonly however if women are also being dragged out that means that this is very serious what's going on so it only paints a picture for us what those families would have gone through men women they're being dragged they're put in prisons so very uh, tough time for the church of jerusalem and this is all within that first eight year period of uh, the birth of the church so what will happen later verse 4 so therefore those who were scattered went everywhere look at that preaching the word it says so the word is in them they have been well equipped they have been well discipled so thank god when the church is planted in such a way there is a true work of the word there is a true work of the holy spirit wherever the sparks go there is a fire so they are going to different places but wherever they were scattered they went everywhere what does it say preaching the word preaching the word so that is the kind those are the kind of believers that you and i are looking for people who can preach the word think about it today so many people come to our churches uh, and they they are with us for two years three years and then they go they get a job in some foreign country they go but have we raised them in such a way have we equipped the churches in such a way uh, or the the believers in such a way that even if this person went for a job to a foreign land they are preaching christ they are being a witness they are sharing the gospel they are praying for people and miracles are happening you know churches are being planted that's the way the disciples the believers of the church of jerusalem were so today how are our believers are they strong in the lord that wherever they go they can preach the lord and it is said that nearly uh, 200 plus villages and towns the jerusalem believers went to and what was what happened instantly there were churches in all those places because believers couldn't keep quiet they would have said hey have you heard about jesus no come let me tell you and the word of god is spreading across so in the in this manner when the ministry is happening there is another volunteer of the church by the name of philip at this point philip is just a volunteer in the uh, church of jerusalem later we will read about him as philip the evangelist right now he's just a volunteer he goes to the city of samaria we saw in the map right north there is samaria so he goes to samaria and preach christ there this is the work this is an evangelistic venture to take christ to a new region so even before we read about paul's missionary journeys there are believers of the church moving around to various parts preaching christ so why was it a big deal to preach christ to the samaritans the samaritans apparently earlier uh, you know that that was a northern kingdom but it was taken over by the assyrians during the rule of the assyrians the jews of the land were forced to marry the assyrians and they uh, you know then the next 
generation or the descendants that came about are the Samaritans. So they are a mixed breed now. Mixed breed, they have the Assyrian blood and the Jewish blood. So the Jews did not respect the Samaritans. That's, that's how it was during those days. The Jews did not like the Samaritans. They did not respect the Samaritans. Remember when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well, John chapter 4. The disciples were amazed. Why is he talking to a lady and that to a Samaritan? So there was not much respect as far as the Samaritans were concerned. But this is the first time that you see people, the Jews, stepping out of their comfort zone and taking the gospel to another community. So in a way, we can call it cross-cultural missions. Is there any other cross-cultural missionary work that we saw earlier? Think about it. Acts chapter 6, when there was a problem for the food, correct. So the Jews and the Hellenists, who are the Hellenists? Hellenists are Greek-speaking Jews. They are Jews only, but culturally they are a little different from the Hebrew-speaking Jews. Again, the Hebrew-speaking Jews did not like the Greek-speaking Jews because the Greek speakers had a little bit of a mixed culture. So the Hebrews thought, oh, we are the ones who are like authentic. We are the traditional, from so many generations, we have kept that line pure. So that way. But there were still missions to another community. And God was working. There were both Hebrew-speaking, Greek-speaking Jews in the church now. Now it's going next level. It's going to another community of the Samaritans. And Philip goes there to preach Christ. Now when Philip preaches, the scripture says in uh, verse 6, multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Remember, just like the ministry of Jesus. Jesus Preached, but he also healed and did miracles. Preaching and healing went together. So the supernatural, we could say in other words, that's how Jesus ministered. It was not just preaching and coming back. So now this evangelist has gone to a place and you can imagine he's gone there. He talked about Jesus, believe in Jesus. Okay, now let me pray for all of you. And miracles are happening. People are hearing and seeing. That is how we must do ministry. Wherever we go. Let's talk about Christ. But let's also demonstrate the power of God. That is the pattern that Jesus gave us. And also the believers of the early church. So in Samaria, the word is being preached along with signs, wonders and miracles. There's also deliverance. Verse 7 says, spirits came out with a loud voice. So people were set free from demon spirits. Many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Wow. There is a powerful demonstration of the supernatural among the people. So what can we expect? What can we expect when uh, ministry is done like this? See verse 8, very beautiful verse. And there was great joy in that city. So wherever we go for missions to impact people, we must pray and say, Lord, we are going, we are taking your word. But along with the preaching of the word, Lord, let there be signs, wonders, miracles. Let people be healed, let people be delivered so that there may be great joy in the city. And in Samaria, there was great joy because of the ministry of Philip. So a good example for us today to follow. And we can make this a prayer also. So people were happy because God was intervening in their lives. Now let's continue. There was a man by the name of Simon. So what is so special about this man? Simon, he became a big, but his background was something unique. 
he practiced sorcery in the city sorcery is uh, uh, we call it black magic witchcraft you know those those are the things so that is who simon is and he was very powerful uh, he was someone very great uh, to the extent that people called him great power of god that was his name can you imagine the people looked at simon and he was so strong in the occult that they called him you are the power of god so what kind of a man would he have been in samaria it just uh, gives us a picture this kind of a person you know can he even be born again but the scriptures tell us that he was his background was he was from the occult but he became born again wow how encouraging today we might look at different people who don't know christ who are dabbling with the occult and who may be rooted in the occult and they're getting their powers from the demonic world can god work in their lives can they be set free can they become people of god of course if the if simon the sorcerer known as the power of the great power of god if he could become a believer of course anybody can become a believer so he became a believer that's wonderful uh you know mighty work of god is being done in the city of or in the region of samaria now what happens simon verse 11 he himself had done many miracles he had astonished the people that's what the scripture says but uh when you know philip philip was preaching and uh, uh doing miracles simon still believed he believed and he was baptized he continued with philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done by philip so he was a man he himself has done miracles he is born again he is baptized and he is astonished by the miracles of philip what does that tell us the supernatural manifestation of the kingdom of god simon has seen lot of lot of miracles but when philip is ministering miracles what does the scripture says he was amazed amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done so the demonic world no matter what it is manifesting the the kingdom of god the powerful manifestations of the kingdom of god are amazing like even simon is saying wow philip this is awesome god is awesome god's work is awesome so he is amazed and uh, the man who astonished others is now astonished that really tells us something about the way god manifested his power in samaria so at this point there are believers there are even people like simon the sorcerer who have come to know the lord and this news has gone to headquarters where is headquarters jerusalem the news has got to jerusalem and saying that uh, so many people are believing in uh, samaria we should do something for them so what did the leaders think of what do you think the leaders want to do now there are believers in samaria what to do let's go build a building make a church teach them more yeah that's a good that's a good uh, way so that's exactly what they thought let's go let's send some leaders we'll teach them more so they sent peter and john the main leaders okay they come from the church of jerusalem they were happy uh, to minister further to the people of samaria so in verse 15 when they came down they prayed for them that they might receive the holy spirit so that seems to be a pattern so as soon as people accept christ what is the next step 
baptism in the Holy Spirit. Everywhere, from now you see, we will go to Acts 9, there also we'll see the same thing. You know, baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit. So that is the pattern. So Peter and John have come so that the people might receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so they start to pray for these people. Verse 17, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. What exactly happened when they received the Holy Spirit? We don't have details. Like, were they speaking in tongues? Were they screaming? Were they shouting? What was happening? Were they miracles? We don't know. Okay? They laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 18. Look at this. It says, When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Verse 19, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Give me this power. Why is he asking for this power? We could say that this man who was so used to the supernatural from the demonic realm, saw something that impressed him. What could that have been? Our assumption is maybe there was the manifestation of tongues. Maybe. Because it was loud and you know he saw people are being filled and people are speaking in the spirit. Something unique, something different. It was attractive to him. To the extent that he says, when I lay hands, same thing should happen. Peter, John, how much money you want? I'll give you. Take money. Give me the same power. Okay? But when Peter heard this, he got really angry. He said, verse 20, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Wow, that's a rebuke. Even for us today, whenever we think, that we can get the power of God by doing this and that. Ah, give an offering, do this, do that, so that we can get. That's not how we get the power of God. We get it by faith. But look at Simon. He thought if he gives money, he can buy the power of God. And Peter was upset with it. He rebuked him. He said, let your money perish with you. Because you're thinking of buying the gift of God. Nobody can. Buy the Holy Spirit. You can't buy the Holy Spirit. So he uh, continues. He says, verse 21, You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, verse 22, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. So Paul, uh, sorry, Peter, is seeing the condition of Simon's heart. And he's saying, you know, Simon, something is wrong with your heart attitude that you even thought that you can buy the power of God with money. So he's calling him to repentance. And he says, you are poisoned, poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. You are a believer. Can believers, can believers... Uh, you know, have the wrong heart attitude and be fleshly, carnal. Possible. Yeah, they are born again, but how come? We must work, uh, you know, on ourselves with the word of God, be renewed with the word of God in our minds. And that's how we become free and we come out, you know, uh, uh, moving towards becoming like Jesus. But at this point, though Simon was born again, baptized, in water, his attitude was wrong. And Peter rebukes him. And thank God, you know, Simon, he uh, repents to God. He says, he tells uh, Peter, pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have sp spoken may come upon me. So that attitude is a good one where he's ready to repent before God. Now, many people ask, what happened to Simon the sorcerer? We don't have reference. Later on, it's not mentioned. So if we go back to some of the commentaries, uh, some people say that uh, 
he repented and he was he became you know like a servant of the lord preaching the gospel and all but we can't confirm we can't confirm and we can only hope that that was the case that uh, he continued serving god but imagine if he didn't repent the strong rebuke would have come upon him okay so that was the situation in samaria so what is the conclusion we can draw mighty ministry was done signs wonders were done which were so impressive that even somebody who experienced the supernatural in the demonic realm was impressed so today we can ask god for the same thing we can say lord your power is very real the supernatural let it be manifest so mightily that the demonic realm the the power of the demonic realm is nothing lord let it be manifest like that we can ask for that we can trust god for uh, people to turn to christ even people like simon who were far away from god and then uh, we can trust god for the holy spirit to be poured out the way it was poured out uh, yeah then of course the work of god was done powerfully in samaria uh, we see that peter and john when they testified and preached the word of the lord they returned to jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the samaritans so around the region they did a missionary work and they uh, went to jerusalem so now when the ministry was done in samaria they went to the surrounding villages also and returned back to jerusalem so it's like a missionary trip which they had after this god speaks to philip now god must have directed him to go to samaria uh, now god is showing him another place how is god communicating to philip in verse 26 an angel of the lord spoke to philip so these are all the ways in which god guides us so god's guidance came through an angel can it come through an angel to you and me do we believe yeah okay even today god can speak through angels what did the angel tell philip arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from jerusalem to gaza so samaria was north now angel is saying go south philip go down to the road that goes from jerusalem to gaza and this is a desert area thank god for a man like philip very nice verse verse 27 so he arose and went how many of us have that testimony when god says something so she got up she went she did it he got up he went he did it philip was that kind of a man very obedient to the word of god he arose and he went and behold why does god send us somewhere because there is an assignment there is an agenda there is a purpose and so the scripture says behold meaning look something was happening there that is why god sent philip to the road to gaza there was a man of ethiopia a eunuch of great authority under candace the queen of the ethiopians who had charge of all her treasury and had come to jerusalem to worship okay so here is our understanding when philip goes to the road to gaza there is an ethiopian eunuch what is so special about this ethiopian eunuch there there is a queen queen of the ethiopians uh or they call her candace candace the queen of the ethiopians so when there is an official of the queen usually they would have they would have been made eunuchs like if you look back at uh, esther people say that those who were caring for the women you know who who would go meet the king uh, they were eunuchs people say that you know his historian say that why there was you know some such way that they had for eunuchs to be um, the ones who were working with the queen or you know the uh, palace so anyway the ethiopian is a eunuch and again what is so special about this uh, ethiopian eunuch is a person of great authority he has a uh, charge of all her treasury so you could say finance minister 
okay, of Ethiopia. Can you imagine? God tells you, get up and uh, go to MG Road. And you get up, you start your bike, you go to MG Road. Finance minister is there, finance minister of some country. Okay. And you don't even know, you've not even read the news. But that is the appointment, it's a divine appointment that God made for Philip. He goes there and there is this person. This person had come to worship God. Jerusalem is the place where people come to worship God. So seems like a, a devout person who believed in God. Sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So what does that tell us about him? Godly man, reading the scriptures, trying to understand the scriptures. Maybe he was trying to understand and he was praying and saying, God, I'm not able to understand. And God told, okay, Philip is just there. He's in Bangalore. Ask him to go to MG Road. Angel comes and says, Philip, you go. And Philip got up and went. So God made a divine appointment. And it's amazing. We will see later on, you know, that Philip goes and explains the scripture to the eunuch. He says, do you know what you're reading? And the eunuch says, no, I don't know. And this was a passage in Isaiah that talks about uh, the lamb being slaughtered. And he explains, you know, this lamb is actually Jesus Christ who has died for your sins. And Philip brings the eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch, to faith in Christ. Okay, So why is this significant? It is significant because this is the first biblical reference where we see that the gospel went to Africa for the first time. But did God tell Philip all that? Did God tell Philip, I'm sending you to finance minister, gospel is going to Africa, it's another continent. For the first time ever, Philip, it's a historical, nothing. God's instructions come to us in a simple way. And God accomplishes great things through that. Some things that we can't even understand. You know, we may just feel that I am doing a simple job, Lord, of praying. I'm just praying. I'm just encouraging. I'm just listening. Uh, I'm just, uh, um, you know, giving some suggestions and uh, guiding someone. But we don't know. God may be taking the gospel to another nation and impacting. In this case, it was an entire continent. A man of influence is getting saved and going back to his country. You can imagine the impact. Philip had no idea. He was just being obedient. He was just being faithful. So what is the lesson that you and I learn from this? We must be obedient to the Lord. Can God do great things in his kingdom through our small obedience? He can. He can. And it happened that day. Okay. So uh, be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And minister to anyone that he may be taking us to. So Philip ministered to this man from the scriptures. Philip opened, verse 35, opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture preached Christ to him. Verse 36, now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? So immediately, you remember the pattern? Being born again, water baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit. So Philip must have told the eunuch about Jesus and about water baptism. So as they are traveling, now that the eunuch is a believer, he says, I can see some water. Can I be baptized? So at that point, you know, uh, Philip says, yes, you can be baptized. So they stopped the chariot. The Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, verse 38, and he baptized him. Who baptized him? Who is Philip? Pastor? Apostle? Prophet? No. How can he baptize a believer? Can I? Huh? Yes, yes. That is our understanding. A believer can baptize another believer. It's fine. 
That's what's happening. Yeah, any any questions? Yeah, you can ask. So, like, there is a spiritual thing in that, man. Like, uh. the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Sorry, water baptism. Uh. What happened is, like, in our childhood, we used to play like this. Right? We have pawns and dolls, so we have Christian friends. We used to see water baptism and dolls, so we used to play like this. Yeah. Okay. The same pattern, what the pastors will do, we'll do. Okay. So, is it real water baptism or not? No, that is not water baptism. Reasons? Whether the people who are being baptized are, they know that they have repented and they have new life in Christ. If you guys didn't at that point, it's not water baptism because repentance is necessary. Number one, and knowing what you're doing is necessary. Second is, Faith on the part of the baptizer is also important. Yeah, Philip is, uh, he's not a leader of the church or anything, but there is faith involved. He's not simply, you know, okay, simply baptized, not like that. There is faith involved. So the baptizer is baptizing by faith in the name of, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, be baptized. That's, that is important. These two things are important. So if you're not having these two things, it's not baptism. Okay. Yeah. So a believer that day baptized this other believer and, uh, you know, they, they come up out of the water. See, again, come up out of the water. That means they are practicing the John kind of baptism, dip in the water, immersion baptism, dip in the water, come up. Uh, and the next two verses again are amazing about Philip. Okay, he has a busy ministry schedule. I don't know how his Google calendar looked like. But at this point, verse 39, the scripture says, once they come up out of the water, verse 39, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Verse 40, but Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So what has happened now? Eunuch is water baptized. As soon as baptism is over, eunuch is seeing Philip, zoom, he's gone. Where did he go? It's like supernatural transportation. It's there in the Bible. Can it happen today? It may happen. Who knows? If God wants us, you know, some other place. So he's taken to another place and Philip is like you know how you can see these sci-fi movies and all suddenly they're not there suddenly they're here and Philip finds himself in a place called Azotus and uh, there what is he doing he's preaching in all the cities till he reaches Caesarea see how God is leading a believer Stephen ordinary believer Philip ordinary believer but mighty in God preaching the gospel everywhere impacting regions, you know, Samaria, now the road to Gaza, Azotis, all the villages leading up to Caesarea, this man is preaching, making an impact wherever he is going. So amazing to see the lives of uh, people in the book of Acts. Okay, so any thoughts, any questions, if you have, please let us know. If not, we are going to pray and close. Acts 8 is one of my favorite. It's full of action. From the beginning to the bottom. Action, action. Okay, so very nice. Praise God. Right. Okay. So then we will pray and uh, close. Uh, anybody from on, on campus batch? You need us? Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful time, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful day you've given to us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for you giving the opportunity to learn more from your scripture, Lord. As you do things, you've done things through yes, your Lord. people, Lord Jesus. Yes. Yes. We are also going Jesus. to see through our life, we are going to see and we are going to do the wonder working of your works, Lord Jesus. Yes, Abba. With your power mm -hmm. and your strength, we will walk for yes. your kingdom, for expansion of your kingdom. Thank you for your using us as a weapon for you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Thank you for Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Francis. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a good weekend.